NOAC, New Oral Anticoagulant, which is being used by everyone. But what is happening is we are also coming across those patients who develop those bleeding or other complications secondary to these NOACs, right? So we'll try to uh, share our experience and knowledge, of course, in this format. So now coming to the introduction, as I already said it, the complications are quite a lot. So we need to understand when to use it, how to use it as well. And as we say, see, um, smartness lies in in preparing or getting ready for the complications much before, in fact. So that is why there's already something what is called as a management team, especially uh, which is there from the hospital to take care for the bleeding management. And normally it consists of cardiologists, hemostasis expert, and also the emergency physicians. So what happens is, uh, it not only allows the members of the team who are taking care of the patient to understand their role, but also you can measure the outcome and also compare them more consistently. So what happens is you can prepare a checklist based standardization of various aspects of the IC practice, which may prove, uh, like, which can prove your facts that you are doing better on morbidity and also, of course, mortality as well. So there are a lot of studies which we are already aware of. So these studies uh, which led to the FDA approval of these NOACs as well, they not only try to compare the NOACs with warfarin, for example, for the stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. So what happened is they also had those groups as well. For example, for dabigatran, which tries to see independently about the different dosages. Okay, so for example, how much of dosing should be used for better efficacy? For example, on the basis of stroke, whenever you are trying to see uh, for the uh, when they try to compare for the NOAC the different dosages of NOAC, which you can see it on the left side of the screen, for example, Dabigatran 150 mg, Dabigatran 110 mg, otherwise Apixaban 5 or 2.5 mg BD, or even Rivaroxaban or Edoxaban as well, when they try to compare it with the Warfarin, as you may see it clearly, so what happened is, uh, oh, the data of course was on an overall basis favoring the NOAC, especially for Dabigatran 150 milligram. Similarly, when they try to see on the parameter of ischemic stroke as well, so on the basis of ischemic stroke as well, when they try to see for the Dabigatran, they saw it like this, there's reduced risk even for Dabigatran 150 milligram, in fact. Okay. Same thing happened when they try to see for the major bleeding. So in fact, for major bleeding as well, there is not either similar, otherwise there is reduced risk. So even for the intracranial bleeding as well, when they tried to see for the different dosages, so they had the results were again have been favoring the NOAC. But again, when we try to see for the dabigatran, it tends to favor the maximum. So there is a, as we always learned in our in our medicine, there's a huge role for our history taking as well. So you should always try to ask, for example, when was the last dose which was taken and also the renal functions of the patient. And also in the meantime, try to ask for the factors which were related to the bleeding risk. For example, how was the age, the comorbidities, okay, and also the renal impairment. And also, what about those associated factors which can increase the bleeding risk or also the source of bleeding, for example, esophagitis, gastritis, or gastroesophageal reflux, or thrombocytopenia, or functional platelet defects as well. And then, on the basis of that, you should also try to ask for if the patient was also taking any other uh, medicine like the aspirin, clopidogrel, or NSAIDs as well. So, for the different NOACs, you can assess them using different methods. So, for example, for dabigatran, you can use APTT, T3, 
TT or even ECT as well. However, those tests cannot be used for the other NOACs. So, for example, for all the other NOACs, of course, you can use the factor anti 10 a assay. Okay? However, PT can be used only for the rivaroxaban and also edoxaban, in fact. So, uh, now coming to the practical guidance for the bleeding management in NOAC treated patients. So, what happens is you can try to classify those patients who, ha who have developed these complications into minor bleeding, moderate to severe bleeding, the life threatening bleeding, and also the ones which may need the emergency surgery. So, uh, so uh, minor bleeding, if someone is, uh, is having, so you can just delay or omit the next dose and you can evaluate the concomitant medication which the person has been taking. And as I said it, in the meantime, you can try to check for the renal function. You can consider any possible underlying source of bleeding as well. In the meantime, reassure the patient and also ensure that the anticoagulation is not at all stopped. So, what to do if there is a patient who is coming to you with complaints of moderate to severe bleeding? So, you should try to control the source. In the sense, you should also use mechanical compression using endoscopy or further surgical hemostasis as well. And you can also take help of your colleagues from the interventional radiology. You may also use FFPs, fresh frozen plasmas, or with supportive measures. For example, in terms of fluid replacement, transfusional support, maintain the diuresis, the hemodialysis, of course. Hemodialysis is very efficient, especially for the dabigatrin, okay? Uh, so this is one of the I would say major difference between dabigatrin and the other NOACs as well. And then, if there is a life-threatening bleeding, so you should try to use this PCC. So what is PCC? PCC is prothrombin complex concentrate, okay? Uh, you can give uh, 50 units per kg. Similarly, uh, yeah, uh, we all are very much aware for dabigatrin, there is already an antidote which is available. It is called as Idaru Suzimab. So, it, it contains of two separate vials of 2.5 gram in 50 ml in ready to use solution. So, and for warfarin, we are already aware, Watchman key exists, which you can be given in terms of 1 to 10 milligram. Okay. Hmm. Um, there are a lot of times these patients will be there for which you need to do the emergency surgery. Emergency surgery, for example, for such kind of patients, it is better if possible to wait for some time. In the meantime, try to check for the anticoagulation status you have, if you have time. And then you can do cross-match blood okay, with the packed RBC in the standby. You can also give PCC, which I already said it is, prothrombin complex concentrate. And if there is dabigatrin, you can use the whole 5 gram. So, PCCs, as I was telling you, so what happens is they do show promise for reversing the anticoagulant effect of the NOAX. And conventional laboratory assays do not correlate well with the bleeding or reversal of the anticoagulation in the setting. It is possible to overshoot and enhance the parameters of thrombin generation to the supernormal level. And this effect is more prominent with the FIBA than the non-activated PCCs. So, uh, they have so far so that in the initial stages, they all have shown pretty prominent or good role for the, uh, this thing, uh, a NOAC reversal in fact. There is a good role of activated charcoal, but only when there is recent or acute ingestion of the drug, in fact. And the, there's, it seems to be pretty good, yes. 
so you can use 25 to 60 grams of the charcoal but as you all are aware there are some problems as well in the sense of compromised airway or there is risk of aspiration or also patients are at the risk of differences as I was telling you if there are several uh, emergency procedures as well which you need to do something like if there is a life threatening uh, bleeding like intracranial bleeding otherwise if there is a critical organ damage for example retroperitoneal or pericardial bleeding otherwise there is a bleeding which is ongoing so you must do something so so as I was already telling you for dabigatran idrasuzumab is there and there is also for example it is called as andexanet which is available for all the NOACs however the problem is it is available only in US in fact so there are some new agents as well something like Seraparantag which is already in phase 2 trials but I'm sure it is going to take a little bit longer so as I was telling you so what happens is uh, it is very important so for example once you have given the uh, this uh, dabigatran inhibitor dabigatran antidote how long does it take so there are several studies which tries to see on this parameter and then they saw was that it does take some time but how much is the time which is taken so what happens is they saw especially for the patients who were admitted with ICH or even the GI bleeds as well up to 2.5 hours okay so uh, within 2.5 hours it tends to stop and then same thing for example uh, when someone the we a group of patients who needed to undergo a emergency surgery or procedure so for those patients from for example once they gave the first vial they saw within 1.6 hours of giving that vial those patients you can do the surgery without any problem so even in South Asia as well uh, they have there are some experiences of the the usage of this drug especially in India I'm pretty aware of in fact there was one such of this case so in which a patient had presented with fracture neck of femur and they used you know, this uh, wonderful molecule and so they gave it around 1540 and they started the procedure around 1820 so and later on uh, there was no problem at all so as I had already shared you this wonderful summary slide so that how you should try to use or classify those patients in terms of minor bleeding moderate to severe or life-threatening bleeding and then on the basis of all those things you can plan up a surgery so as I had already said it it is very important for the hospital to develop such teams develop such teams why because um, there are uh, these teams tend to become literally the expert for all these seeing all these things in fact and they can look up to the uh, not only the local or national guidelines uh, which are already formulated by the leading authorities leading authorities I mean is the European Heart Rhythm Society or the European Society of Cardiology as well and there are already some of these really nice guidelines in fact from these otherwise there are some uh, existing protocols as well which is present